Welcome, everyone, to our NCMF's uh, National Cybersecurity Week uh, Queer Awareness uh, panels and special speakers this week. Um, today, we're going to actually talk with um, a number of young professionals in cybersecurity. So for those of you that are uh, curious about uh, the profession, we've got some folks that are either still in college, uh, just recently graduated from college, um, and some that have been out of school for a bit and um, are in the workforce and can actually help you uh, perhaps navigate, um, definitely answer any questions that you might have about um, starting in the field college classes and so forth. Um, we're, I'm going to um, uh, introduce our one of our panelists and moderator, um, Maria Marinelli. So Maria is a systems engineer and project manager on a number of DOD contracts. Um, she is also a CEO and co-founder of a company called Calibrate Corporation, a startup in the defense con contracting industry um, in Fort Meade, Maryland. Um, she earned her bachelor's degree in mathematics from Mount St. Mary College uh, in Emmitsburg, Maryland, and she's very passionate uh, about adv advancing STEM education and has volunteers with organizations including ASIA, uh, the CCBC, and the uh, CCBC Cybersecurity in Institute, Girls on Code, and the Fort Meade Alliance, and she'll talk about those as well. So I'm going to turn over the program to Maria. Welcome. Thanks, Christine, and it's great to be with all of you today. Thanks for calling in. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our other panelists who are joining us today and then dive into some questions. Please feel free to ask questions throughout. I think Christine and Mark are going to help monitor the chat and let us know when questions come in. So first, I'll introduce Taylor. So Taylor is the Digital Forensics Lab student lead at Capital Technology University, where she is a junior. And in that role, she is responsible for maintaining a cyber safe and functional learning environment providing the ability to forensically analyze a wide range of devices. She's worked as a public speaker and educator for her school. She's been involved in Girls Who Code, as have I, as well as volunteering with the National Cryptologic Museum. And she's really passionate about inspiring students who are interested in getting into the field. So Taylor's here today. Our other panelist is Adam. So Adam is the technical director of the National Security Agency's Science of Security Initiative. In that role, he does a lot of great things. A few of them are he sets the technical direction for research projects at 18 of the Science of Security funded universities and leads the NSA's best cybersecurity paper competition. He received his PhD in engineering and public policy um, from Carnegie Mellon University and prior to that earned his bachelor's degree in computer science from Princeton. So Adam is joining us as well. We may have a third panelist join in late. If we do, his name is Blair. He's a recent Purdue graduate with a master's in business analytics and information management. After he graduated, he passed uh, the Security Plus certification and is currently working towards the Advanced Security Practitioner designation. He as well, um, along with the rest of the group, is passionate about raising awareness for cybersecurity and the intersection of cyber and data science. So those are our panelists today, and we're going to dive in with some questions. So the first question for the group, Taylor and Adam, you both have very technical backgrounds from your undergraduate and advanced studies. Uh, what inspired each of you to first get into computer science or forensics? And maybe Taylor, can we start with you? Yeah, I'll start. So even though I have the technical degree and background, in full honesty, my background really lied with the humanities and the arts, like English and art was always what I, what I was good at, because I really enjoyed the creative fields. And getting into Girls Who Code, just looking for something to do, is honestly what led me to cybersecurity, because even though cybersecurity is lumped in with all of the STEM field, it is genuinely a creative field that relies a lot on problem solving which I think is what really attracted me to the field in the first place. Awesome. Thanks, Taylor. Um, we'll hand it over to Adam. So I pretty much had the natural attraction to technology ever since pretty much as, as I uh, ever remember. I remember being excited about learning the multiplication tables. And then when I got to kindergarten, being able to have, you know, I, I kind of took naturally to learning how to program. We, we used um, Terrapin logo, which, many still still use uh where you program make shapes using uh like an etch -a sketch effectively is my best description and then it just kept growing until i got to high school 
when I realized that I actually weren't just a pure technical person. I actually had the communication skills too. And so I, I ended up charting a uh, education that bridged the two between uh, policy and communications and technical. And that's pretty much where I am now. Very cool. Thanks, Adam, for sharing. And um, as I mentioned before, Blair has now joined the group. Um, we did go over your intro, Blair, and the first question we were talking about, if you want to provide a response, is for you to get into this field and start studying in school. And I know um, for you specifically, your background maybe started out a little different as an undergrad. Um, so can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So um, I actually uh, played college basketball out in Southern California. After graduating, I worked for worked as a registered investment advisor for two years. Kind of fell in love with analytics uh, before deciding to look for something new. You know, I then moved to a cybersecurity company as an executive and caught the IT security bug. And um, you know, after realizing how much I loved the technical and analytical work, I decided to get a master's uh, from Purdue in uh, business analytics and information management. And then towards the end of the program, I had the pleasure of meeting uh, Christine and Mark and. You know, since then I picked up uh, one, uh, one certification and now I'm working towards designation. You know, it's just it's just something I'm really passionate about. Very cool. Um, and I know for me, um, being a math major, um, I always excelled in math growing up, really loved math. But going into my career from there, I realized the connection between project management systems engineering with math because I've always loved solving problems. I love um, working on teams. And so it was kind of a natural transition there for me, even though it, it seems kind of unexpected. And I know for some, maybe when you were growing up or, you know, in middle or high school, like some of the students listening in today, you maybe really enjoyed different subjects than then um, and hobbies that maybe then led you to identifying your passion and, and being where you are now. Does anyone want to share a story about, you know, something that seems unexpected in your story, but makes sense in light of, you know, what your natural talents are or things you excelled in in school? Yeah, I can start with that one if you want. Because um, with what I mentioned before with English and art, like pretty much up until I got into computers, that was my main goal and aspiration. I was going to study English or, or go to art school for college. But being able to write, just write nonfiction or fiction writing is honestly super, super beneficial when it comes to writing code and figuring out how computers work. Because in tech and cybersecurity and computer science, a lot of manuals, instructions, and guides are written in very technical, heavy language to where it can almost seem borderline intimidating to get into where it's just so confusing because of all the jargon. So being able to read and write well and understand composition not only helps you sort of decipher what all of those weird terms and acronyms mean, but also write your own guides to things. Because I've written a couple pieces on some cybersecurity how-tos and tutorials, and the main response that I've gotten to it is being able to write it it just simply is super, super beneficial. So, yeah, definitely English composition has been one of the things that doesn't seem like it would matter too much, but has honestly helped me the most. That's a great point you bring up, and it's something I've been thinking about, too, the fact that for students, when they think about a career in cyber, they likely think of, you know, maybe a software engineer or a very technical hands-on-the-keyboard kind of role, um, but don't always realize how many different roles and skill sets go into building a successful team in the field. So I think that's a great point to raise. And uh, maybe for the others in the group, can you share a little bit about maybe what is the role of a teammate you work with that maybe it's a role that students wouldn't think of originally when they think of a role in cyber, but is something that's key for your team's success. So I'm part of a team of about four individuals and we have very different skill sets. And I have the uh, computer science undergrad degree, doctorate in uh, engineering and public policy, which I looked at uh, cybersecurity uh, strategies for nations. And I have a colleague who's an anthropologist, you know, really, you know, that that's looking at uh, societies. Uh, I also have another colleague. Uh, she did her um, undergraduate work on uh, psychology. And a fourth that we had, uh, she was an expert in, well, this is going to come out really interesting. She uh, was a professional ballet dancer and, is, and uh, has been in the fashion industry. So... Together, we really accomplish quite a bit in, uh, in these tasks. So, I mean, we have the aspects of, 
you know, dealing with, you know, we, we're working across the world. Um, my team, I, I was just sending emails to uh, Germany this morning. So we're, we, we work with people from our, around the world and we have to put these uh, different aspects of cybersecurity together and create a coherent research for the, for the country. And even the people we work with is incredibly diverse. I mean, absolutely, there are the uh, cybersecurity professionals from uh, in computer science and electrical engineering. But I have uh, philosophers. Uh, one of my projects is a philosophy professor and his students looking at what it means to be resilient. What does that mean from a from that kind of perspective, which is you know quite the broad area from those thought provoking parts of cybersecurity to the guys who are actually coding up some new tool that we need. Absolutely. And I think that'll be very eye opening for the students listening to hear, you know, how many different skill sets and perspectives and and roles go into building a successful cyber team that gives you the ability to be able to look at the problem from different standpoints and share expertise. And I know for my role as a systems engineer and project manager, recognizing the importance of you know, being able to define a problem and work with your end user if it's a capability you're building or with whoever your client is that has a problem and being able to communicate what those needs are to a technical team that then implements a solution and being able to to help that group work together and leverage everyone's strengths and skill sets. I think about, you know, building a high-performing team and the fact that you can bring together a bunch of talented people, but unless you're able to really facilitate matching people's strengths to the problems that need to be solved and helping them work well together, it's hard to fully leverage that team. So I think all those different pieces go into building a successful team. One of the questions I just saw we got in the chat, they were asking, what's a day in the life like um, in your career? And I know we have um, Taylor and Blair, both students. So maybe Adam, I'll pass it back to you if you want to tell them a little bit more about what that day in the life is and what are like some of the tools and techniques you use in your role and where did you acquire those skills? I generally never have a standard day. Well, the only thing that begins pretty much all days is I get to work and yeah, I'm still getting to work right now and check my email. And then it will go in a very different directions depending on what kind of day. Some days I am working on I sometimes code up as some type of project or, or, or something along those lines. And generally I don't program for security tools that that isn't my main area. I will program challenges for students to solve and, and work on and inspire STEM outreach or uh, some other days I will be um, working at evaluating research. I, I lead a uh, competitions, uh, different types of cybersecurity competitions and I lead one on the, uh, we identified the best cybersecurity paper. So I was working on that this morning where I was thanking all the public people who nominated papers for us. Earlier in the year, I was reviewing uh, 50 papers to look at, say, what criteria, which one has the most merit and is most inspirational for the whole community. Some days I'm posting online and interacting uh, out there and trying to bring stuff together. Yesterday, I was working at organizing a conference where I have a, a team of people from, I guess, around the world at this point, who uh, are working with me to actually pr- present a conference in April. And we have various uh, different types of papers, and you, we have to bring all the right parts together. So I don't really have an, ever a traditional day, but I, I work on various different things that uh, happen, and uh, it's a lot of working with people. And, and also it's technology because it's not a single person's, uh, world in cybersecurity. It's, it's a team sport. A lot of times we have to work with our, uh, teammates. Absolutely. That's definitely a good point to bring up too about the importance of communication. And for the students hearing, you know, how much communication and working with people goes into your role. And, Maybe emphasizing, too, the importance of even if you are in a hands-on the keyboard, as they say, technical role, it's still so important to build those good communication skills and teamwork skills to be able to, to work with others and have that effective collaboration and also be able to explain, you know, if you encounter a challenge, especially when you're early in your career and you're learning a lot on the job, being able to recognize 
how to call out questions to be able to ask of others on your team and having that, you know, ability to really communicate well. Taylor, I know your role in the lab at, at your school is a different perspective for the students to hear. So can you tell us more about what your day-to-day is like and what skill sets you use in your role? Yeah, so I sort of now have two day-to-days because I both currently lead the forensics lab and also a full-time student and I have an internship in security management and compliance, which is still very new, hence the wonderful car background. But sort of being able to, it for the forensics lab, I am pretty much self-employed. My school has given me the lab to do what I want to do with, which is a fantastic opportunity. I can't speak about that enough in a greater tone. But pretty much my day-to-day is either... I am training myself in something or I'm looking for something new to train myself in because one of the things that a lot of people who are new to cybersecurity are looking at it don't always realize is just how much of a growing field it is because every new piece of technology, every update, that permanently changes the field. So even if you are a full-on expert in something, you won't be an expert in it for long. Everyone is a beginner in learning everything, which is what I do in the forensics lab. I look at all the different new tools that come out, all different softwares, and also all the different devices that you can use to analyze. So yeah, my uh, day-to-day life with the forensics lab is not that typical. It luckily isn't so much a nine-to-five, whereas the management and compliance is a bit more in line with what you'll see out in the real world job market. Pretty much with this, I go in and then I begin network scans and going through the results of seeing any sort of anomalies in the system and then going through and collecting what is called artifacts, which is pretty much screenshots and records of scans, updates, things that were installed, deleted, etc. Because if you think about how much data and information on a network, especially when multiple people are working on it, having evidence of what you do so you can reference it, super, super useful. And not a lot of people think about it. So yeah, I I don't exactly have a typical day-to-day life. I have many, many different variations. Yeah. And I think that in itself is an important uh, important thing for students to realize. Like when you're a student in school and your classes are well prescribed and, you know, students are taking classes together and you're involved in multiple things. But when you get into the workforce or even as, you know, a college student who's having internships and doing different things, there's definitely, I would say, a lot of ambiguity involved or needing to kind of you know, figure things out and figure out where you can fit in and contribute to a team. And um, sometimes that doesn't mean a consistent day to day. But one of the things I've thought about recently is how if you are on a team and you're trying to figure out, like, what's the right fit for me? Or even if you're a student, it's so important to figure out, well, you know, where do I see a need either on a team or in an organization, a group that you can try to help fill? And I feel like lots of the discovery comes from just kind of trying things out. And I know, Blair, for you, your path has, you know, led to a lot of discovery and kind of trying different things and figuring out what's the right fit for you. So can you tell the students a bit more about what that discovery process looked like and what advice would you share with them if they're not, you know, quite sure yet what they want to do, which I think it at their age is totally understandable. I think for lots of us, even in college, we weren't sure. But what are some things that could help them now in terms of navigating that discovery process? Yeah, of course. So I really think it just starts with, you know, kind of chasing your curiosity and chasing your passion, whatever that may be. You know, frankly, cybersecurity won't be the right industry for a lot of students. But, you know, for the students that are interested in it, that, that you know, kind of did catch that technical bug, you know, there's plenty of room for you. And, and you should definitely just keep you know, pursuing that curiosity. I had a a professor from my undergrad that um, one of his favorite things to say was, you know, as a, as a young professional, what we're really trying to do is moonwalk into the future. So if you if you look back on your past and you can, you know, kind of see trends in what, you know, had been captivating you and, and catching your attention, and you can use that information to kind of move forward in, into the, the future that you want to build for yourself. So really, it's, I would just say to stay curious and you know, just keep chasing your passions. That's awesome. I'm going to hand it back over to Adam to maybe tell us a little bit more about, you know, what 
might have been the things that have surprised you the most about working in this field, even compared to the level of education you've had, because you've gotten your PhD. And I think there's definitely a transition that happens between being a student and being in the workforce and seeing what things kind of surprise you. So what's something that has surprised you about working in the field? (laughs) So I I remember when I first started, uh, one of the biggest surprises is like how long the eight hour workday is that that was like I, I know it sounds crazy because as a student you're like no I, I work from 750 or at least for me I would work from 755 a.m. when classes started you would go all through the day you would come home you would do homework and yet somehow the workday seems so much longer when I when I first started so that that was an adjustment and you know, I, I think is that in school, life is changing over the day. You're, you're doing different things. But when you first start to work and you're like, okay, you have, you're doing this and this is what you're doing today. And eventually you, you st- as you become more experienced and get more involved at work, your day becomes more different. So you have, you, you it'll start becoming more like, what you're used to, where you have maybe a meeting here, you have a programming assignment here, uh, you'll have a video call maybe between 11.45 and 12.30. You may have a video call for some reason that comes to mind. And as you start working on these different projects, your day becomes more and more I- interesting. So, And you get used to the idea that I am working. I'm, I'm not going to you know, multitask and switch over to TikTok or something like that. You're, uh, you're doing work for for eight, eight and a half hours, nine, depending on what kind of day it is. So that was one adjustment. The other real big adjustment was, is that at least for me, I was kind of a top tier student pretty much all the way through school. As school got more difficult, my uh, ranking, of course, went down. But still, I, I, I had that perspective of I kind of knew everything. I knew what was going on. I did really well in all my classes. And then when you get to work, you're back at zero. So all of a sudden, you're still learning all the new things. You're like, how do I, what's the name of the printer? How do I send a, a print, do something in printing? Or I, everybody has all this experience, which is really a different thing from coursework. And you're like, oh, how do I, do you, yes, you program this. I, I can program that. But all of a sudden, you need to get the right people to agree that that's the way you wanted to program it. And so it's much more of a, uh, you have to learn from uh, your mentors and uh, more senior people into understanding what it is to be an excellent employee and, uh, you know, and eventually a leader in, uh, in technology. So those were some of the transitions that were definitely interesting. Absolutely. And I love that you point out the transition from college to the workforce. It's kind of like being a, a small fish in a, in a big pond again, because for me, it was a similar thing. Um, I was top of my class in college, did really well as a student. And then when I started my career, um, my first job was at Lockheed Martin, which is a fantastic company, but a huge company. And I was the most junior person on a big software development team. And for me, I didn't have a, a background in, in programming, really. And I took maybe a couple classes in college. But for me, there was definitely a moment of feeling a little bit insecure and trying to figure out, you know, where can I contribute, where can I help? And I think it's important for students to realize that as you make transitions like that throughout your education, throughout your career, and you're kind of starting from square one again, you know, don't be discouraged by having that feeling or realization of, you know, this is really new to me. I feel like the junior person here, even if you've just, you know, come off of being the most senior person at something. And I saw a quote recently that I really love now, and um, it was saying that, you know, When people transition to doing something new or they're taking on something big, the fear that holds them back, it's not always that they're afraid of failing. Like maybe they realize, you know, they could do it, but if they put in a lot of work, but the the fear is more so they don't want to be seen starting small. And I think that really resonated with me because I've done different shifts in my career and just in the past year have been starting my own company and going from a big company like Lockheed Martin to now kind of venturing out to to do my own thing for some people is definitely unexpected. And, you know, maybe others thought it wasn't a wise move, but um, it was something I was passionate about and knew I wanted to do. And even to be, you know, starting small, recognizing that that's okay. And lots of times 
you know, venturing into something new or being in the point of starting small, those are the times when you're really like stretching and growing. And so I guess for Taylor and Blair, actually, Blair, maybe we'll start with you. Like when you kind of made that pivot and decided to go after your master's, I'm sure that was, you know, a, a tough transition maybe at first or in your classes. Did you ever have that moment of of thinking, you know, this is tough. I'm not sure if it's the right fit for me and what helped you get through that? Yeah. So, um, you know, absolutely. There was definitely that moment. Uh, I think it was the summer semester, second mod, you know, and we, we were taking our first uh, programming class and I had taken some, you know, massive open online courses before that to just kind of prepare. But, you know, the speed at which the class was moving and just the, the caliber of students I was around, it was, it was definitely eye opening. But then as we started doing a little bit more group work, you know, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier where, you know, having diverse group of people to work with on a team is, um, I think, invaluable because it's it's really about where your blind spots are. You know, if you have a group of four or five people and they're all excellent at the same thing, but, um, you know, it might, they might have great project management skills or time management skills or or just, um, just staying on task and kind of keeping the big picture in mind. So I really kind of got over that with when I was working on these teams and you know, I, I did see myself delivering value on, on a lot, you know, on, on every team I was on. So, um, that really helped me kind of overcome the, you know, the initial insecurity that, you know, I might not have the technical skills. Um, but, you know, I think we all bring, you know, different things to the table in different ways. Very cool. Um, that made me think of something too. It's like, you know, for students and especially students who may be listening right now who I think have access to a lot more resources than each of us had at that stage in our education based on, you know, the technology that's available to them and the ways they can get connected and go online and research things. And and I've seen lots of schools in the area really take advantage of that and start shifting you know, kind of technology, competence, awareness for students to a younger age and getting them more involved in that. Something along with that, I think, is it's really important for students to recognize that they have a supportive network. Even if they they maybe don't think of it right away, they can be asking their teachers, their guidance counselors, students that are older than them or in different clubs to be able to learn and expand their horizon. So for you as an undergraduate, like when you were an undergraduate student, and same question to Taylor, what were some of the resources you took advantage of as a student that helped you along the way? So luckily, even though I'm a junior in college, my time in high school was really not that long ago. I'm currently only 19 years old, so I'm just barely an adult. So a lot of the resources that I used for cybersecurity were not ones that were offered through my school. My school was adapting the technology, but still not teaching it. So I was pretty much on my own. One of the greatest things that I can recommend for people who are experienced with computers and not at all to try out are online CTFs or capture the flags. Now, what these are is these are pretty much competition style cybersecurity challenges where you can go through a wide variety of different categories and subjects and complete different problems on it. There are so many that are out there for free. Uh, Pico CTF, for instance, is a good beginner friendly one. And these CTFs, because a lot of them will cover so many different categories, it's really good for not only seeing what you already know that you didn't realize you knew, what you don't know yet and want to learn, and also what you're really passionate about. CTFs is really how I made the transition of knowing that I like cybersecurity to I really like digital forensics. So yeah, if you're able to, and you can do this on pretty much any computer you want, find an online CTF. That's one of the best ways to do hands-on learning. And they're also pretty fun to do and usually don't take too much time out of your life. So yeah, I would definitely recommend those. Awesome, Taylor. And I'd love to hear in the chat, I know we have lots of educators on the call. If any of you out there have involved your students in online capture the flag or are interested to learn more, we'd love if you post in the chat or kind of share amongst the group, you know, what are some of the resources that you've used with your students and how that's gone. Um, I'm sure plenty would benefit from that. So thanks, Taylor. That's awesome. Flair, do you want to share with us what are some of the resources as a student that were helpful for you? Uh, yeah, I, I think I'm going to really echo Taylor here. I, I mean, I do have a little bit more exposure to the you know, analytics data science side of things. So um, I've been working on a lot of like fraud detection and, and spam detection models. 
but you know that's that's a little bit more on the model building side. Whereas if um, you know you're really diving into the computer science skills, you know that's going to be a lot more to capture the flag. And I've actually been you know kind of dipping my toes in that over the last few months. So you know that, that really resonates, Taylor. Very cool, um, Adam. How about you? I know you do a lot of work with universities, and so you work with lots of students, lots of educators. What's maybe a different perspective to this that you want to discuss? Research. So one of the things that I really work on it with is science fairs. So science fair is uh, a lot of schools have them, and then you have the whole Regeneron process. So as my organization, we sponsor cash prizes for the uh, finalists in uh, where they compete in cybersecurity as part of the larger science fair. So we're, you know, trying to give you out, you know, our first prize is uh, $3,000. And a lot of times we'll pay for you to fly to NSA to meet with us, which usually requires a guardian because how many people actually know that um, when you're minors, you can't check into hotel rooms, which makes life way more complicated on, on our side. So, so just, you know, getting out to that. And one of the things that I have noticed that is really an attribute of excellence and it really helps jumpstart it is people who are completely are willing to, to go out there and contact people who they they may not know, but think might be useful and relevant to what they're interested in. I think that's a very common attribute of people who are successful in the field is saying, oh, uh, I look at some of the high school kids I've worked with and they're like, well, I was doing math in my high school and there really weren't any more classes. So I, uh, I contacted this professor at University of Pennsylvania and said, I'm interested in this. And he's like, oh, that's my research area and went on with that. I mean, not, not everybody's interested in, uh, these math concepts that are beyond, you know, I'm not a math PhD in this and they are. But the idea is that for me, I find it very difficult to go out and just start talking to people. But doing that is really the way you connect out to those resources and get to know people. And the, you'll learn things and you, that information just keeps helping you advance your interests and your careers. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great perspective, Adam. And one thing you mentioned that got me thinking is, you know, when you put yourself out there and, and try different things, inevitably there are going to be times that things don't go as you planned or you hit some sort of setback or failure. And I know from talking previously, you have a, a story that I think the students would like to hear, which is, you know, what's an example of, of a failure or, you know, something you've encountered in your career and how did you respond to that? Okay. So I know what you're, you're trying to get me to get you in. So, I got out of high school thinking I was, you know, super expert in math. And so I went off to college and was like, and you have different levels of classes and you were like, all right, which class do you take? And I'm like, I know what math, so I'm going to take a honors multivariable calculus. And, you know, everybody else is thinking, what are you about to do? So that pretty much was the hardest class I've ever taken in my life or Latin would probably be is a close competitor. And, you know, you start off and, I should have started seeing the warning signs early and saying, oh, I'm not doing so well in this class. And as my grade continued to decrease as we kept getting to this, uh, you know, just the, my ability to, you know, recognize uh, the limits of my ability and my learning style. I mean, our, our teaching instructions were, uh, here is the proof, this mathematical proof of how you integrate in parts over multiple variables. And thus, you understand how to do it. And it's like, no, I'm definitely an engineer in the sense that I actually need to do it. It's not just the theory of how to do it. And eventually, I, I worked really hard in this class, and I didn't pass it. And so what do you do? And at that point, you could say, uh, well, I didn't do well in this one prerequisite for everything, so I should abandon my dreams and completely change my areas, try something easier. Or... In my case, the next year we came at it and uh, we took multivariable calculus again. I did a lot better and you can get over pretty much any obstacle, even when you, it may seem like it's an end, it, you can keep on going. It, they're always a path to get where you, you want to go and where you want to, you, you're dreaming of getting to. So don't lose hope, even if it gets hard and you, you come into some type of roadblock. And in fact, it may give you a, teaching experience that you use later and teaching, talking to a bunch of middle school and high school students. Could happen. 
That's awesome, Adam. Yeah, I think that's a really good story and perspective for them to hear because something I think about, too, is, you know, from being a student versus being in the workforce. Um, when you're a student, lots of times, you know, you're you're taking a test or you're doing a project and there's some concept of what's the right answer and what's the right approach. And things are a little more within the lines versus especially in roles like we have where we're, you know, leading teams and working with lots of people and dealing with really hard subjects, there's not always a clear or prescribed right answer or best approach. And sometimes, lots of times, you need to evaluate lots of different options and try to pick, even if something's not the perfect path forward, it could still be, you know, most likely the best path forward. And you take into account lots of different variables when you're making those decisions. And inevitably, there are going to be times that you miss the mark. And I know from being a project manager, and having a large team of engineers that I work with, actually several teams in my portfolio, there are tricky things that also come into play with, you know, different personalities or different perspectives on how to approach something and different challenges. And, you know, the opinions are taken into account. Maybe you have many different customers and you're trying to agree on a requirement. And so it's really important to be resilient in that way that, you know, if you encounter a situation where, you made your best decision you could, you went forward with it and it didn't work out, recognize, like you said, that that's a learning experience and it helps you refine your sense of decision making. Like there's, there's a lot of gray matter when it comes to the field that we're in. And especially when you're working with lots of people, it's important to have that resilience. And I think one steady thing that kind of underlies that, that students can think about, because I'm sure they encounter situations in school on group projects or working in a, like if they have a club or a team for something, it's important to stay true to your values and to think about, you know, how things are going to impact the people involved in your team. And then the more experiences you have, the more you're able to refine that sense of um, decision making. So for Blair and Taylor, maybe we'll start with Blair. Can you tell us about a time that maybe as a, in the, the work you were doing when you first got out of school, working on a team, is there a situation you can think of or something you encountered that was this sort of like gray area and how did you approach that? Absolutely. So, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, out of school, I worked as a registered investment advisor. And um, a part of that role was uh, administering retirement plans. Now, I, I don't want to, you know, speak poorly of any, anything in the financial services industry, but there are some, you know, less than ethical practices that, that happen out there. And um, it was really, you know, we came together as a team. It, was a, it wasn't a, a very large company, but we came together as a team and, and decided we wanted to offer these plans that had, you know, highly ethical plans that, really put the plan participants first. And then we actually had a fiduciary duty to carry that out on these retirement plans. So, I mean, that was just that was just a part of the values that we're talking about that um, I think are important. And as we move forward, and, you know, I think the triple bottom line is really going to be, it'll be here to stay. And um, I think that'll just be a part of businesses as usual here in the future. So, I mean, that would probably be the example that comes top of mind, first of all. Maria, I I see a bunch of a uh, number of questions as our time is starting to wind down. One of which is from Nickerson, who's asking: Since everyone is done with college, what are some pointers for a high school student entering college? So, Blair, we'll start with you since you're you, you're the since you're the most recent graduate. We'll start with you, and then um, Taylor, Adam, and then Maria. Yeah, I mean, I'll just kind of echo what's been said earlier. Just stay curious. Just whatever you're passionate about, um, just keep pursuing it. Really, it's just. As long as you keep that curiosity, um, you know, there's, there's not going to be much that stops you. So, you know, especially in IT security, we're, we're going to be lifelong learners. You know, it's like Taylor mentioned earlier that, you know, the technologies and tools that we're using now won't, you know, may not be relevant in the next five years even. So, you know, just, just find something that you're really passionate about and just to keep plugging away. I guess my main piece of advice sort of really echoes that is just take as many classes in as many different fields as possible. Don't, overwhelm yourself but also don't be afraid try something new because even I haven't graduated I'm in my junior year of college but even with my classes and the internship and the lab that I work at I'm still exploring the different niches of cybersecurity, seeing what I really really like what I'm really passionate about and cybersecurity is really good for just exploring all these different things so yeah don't be afraid to jump into the deep end of something that you don't fully know you might find something you really like 
Yeah, I totally agree with what Taylor and Blair just said. It's so important to let yourself be open to maybe changing your interests or your perspective over time, both, you know, in high school, but even in college. Um, I originally wasn't a math major. I switched over my sophomore year. I was originally going to do international business and French. I kept the French, but swapped the international business for math. And it was just like a discovery process my freshman year and realizing it was something that I was really passionate about. I missed taking math classes my freshman year compared to when I was in high school. So and then from there, just, you know, kept rolling and discovered really what my passion was. And um, the other advice I would offer is always take as best advantage as you can of mentors and resources that are available to you, definitely in in high school, even middle school. Um, But when you go to college as well, try to be connected to different organizations on campus, different groups, and reaching out to your professors and whatever counselors you have available to you. Um, It's really important to get plugged into things. And by doing that and even trying different clubs or groups, it helps you discover more of what you're interested in. I would reinforce that last part. Getting involved in clubs and groups definitely adds the robustness to your uh, college education. It it really helps you meet people and you become friends. And very times these friends could last a lifetime. So those are some of the really important takeaways from um, for me for attending college. So another question is, is a degree in cybersecurity more useful than, say, a degree in business, or does it depend on the part of cybersecurity you're planning on doing? Interesting question, Uh, in the sense that your degree doesn't really matter when it comes to long-term careers, because you can be doing, look at my teammates. I have ballet dancer, anthropologist, computer scientist, and psychology, but the degree really matters in shaping how you think. And the other part is helping you to present yourself, get your that that first job. So in that sense, you you should be looking at it as deciding where do you want to start, and that's that's where your degree will help you. That's your starting point where you'll go from, and so you'll you'll choose based off of where you want to begin. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Absolutely, you know, once you're out of school and you get into your career and you start seeing like for a few of us our our undergrads are a lot different than when we what we ended up doing and um I agree it's really important to pick something that you're passionate about. If you're starting to take classes in something you decide to major in and you're realizing, you know, this isn't something I'm passionate about really learning or diving into, think about maybe like what are the problems that you get most excited about solving because everything comes down to solving problems or being analytical in some way or being in the process of like creating something. And so what is that big topic area that you're maybe most interested in or most excited about learning more, even if it's not something that's maybe your your current biggest strength, you know, like maybe you're really good in one subject, but you're more passionate about something else and you're willing to put in the time and learn it. That's another thing you can think about too. Yeah. And I would say one of the most valuable things that a degree can give you is hands-on experience. And while a degree is the best way, a degree is a great way to get it, it's not the only way. I, of course, don't have the perspective outside of college, but I would say the name of the degree doesn't matter as much as long as you're able to get the hands-on experience, which you can get through degrees, trade school, certifications, or even just on your own for free online. So I would prioritize the experience over degree or the name of the degree specifically. Yeah, I I think that's a great point. Um, But, you know, I kind of sound like a broken record here where, um, you know, if you're passionate about business, you know, definitely major in business and and kind of see how that can pertain uh, pertain to cybersecurity. If you're more technical and you you like kind of getting your hands dirty and putting fingers on a keyboard, I would definitely um, look at the uh, cybersecurity degree. Um, but really that just is, is going to come down to what your preferences are and what you're interested in. And, and there's no right answer to go about it. So, uh, you know, just kind of, just kind of trust yourself and just kind of do what you like doing. There were, there were two others. And I think that you guys may have hit on um, some of these uh, uh, answers already. Um, how might one gain the experience of this field? So Taylor, you talked earlier about, um, CTEs or CTFs, catch the flag um, competitions. Do you want to kind of summarize some of those examples that you provided earlier? Yeah, so the CTFs give great uh, experience for the field I said earlier. Some of the areas specifically include like steganography, reverse engineering, malware engineering, or malware analysis, sorry. Another 
thing that I would recommend doing at home to get experience, which you can do most of these on any computer whatsoever, is study through Code Academy because learning how to code and learning how computers work, super, super beneficial. And also there are a multitude of videos and free course modules out there. Cyber is a good example, although not all of the resources are free. Cyber Aces and just straight up YouTube are fantastic ways to get experience and knowledge. Before going to university for cybersecurity, I pretty much self-taught everything on a Chromebook that shut down every single hour. So you don't need to have a computer that is meant to run all these great programs to get experience. So yeah, and even if you're just starting out, I would honestly just recommend YouTube. Crash Course and so many other YouTube channels are super great for learning about the field, and you can figure out what you want to get hands-on experience in after that. Maria, I saw your uh, your head not, nodding here, and I'll let you. Yeah, work. I agree you. with Taylor. I was thinking. Yeah, I was thinking about that too. Like, you know, the amount of resources that students have access to just going online these days. I was going to recommend YouTube as well. Like, that's a great point to be able to to see like so many organizations will put out like even short learning videos that talk about what does, you know, kind of things we've addressed, like what does a career in XYZ field entail or, you know, what are some of the key skill sets? And that can prompt then discovery to go back and and look for other topics and kind of see, you know, which things strike a chord. And then anything, you know, that a student is, is seeing online or they're interested in, and then they maybe want to find out more and they've hit a wall, always go to your teacher or your teachers and your parents or even other, you know, students at your school and have conversations. Because I think that's such a big piece too is like lots of the perspective we're giving today we're trying to give I think the other side of just the technical and you know what's the real life like experience like for each of us and that's such valuable information to be able to get so it's so important to just take the initiative and and reach out and ask questions as well. Um, So Maria I actually wanted to toss back to you I know that um, we wanted to kind of do if you will kind of lightning round of your parting words to the students today so I'll let you start and then again you guys can all uh, add in your parting thoughts for the students today. Sure. I'd say um, my main parting thought is be courageous enough and willing enough to try new things and to follow wherever your interests and and skills lead you and um, really do your best to be plugged in and connected, you know, to other students via clubs and groups and with your um, teachers and with others who are around you to provide that support, especially when you're a student, everyone wants you to be successful. You know, your teachers are there doing their best to help you be successful and go through this discovery process. So be willing to be bold in asking questions and trying new things. Adam, how about you? Party thought for our students. Party thought, get involved and try things. If you have a computer, use virtual machines so that way you don't have to worry about breaking your own computer. So go out there and explore, try and meet people. Terrific. Taylor. I would say don't be afraid to be the only person like you in the room, whether that means you think you know the least or that you're the most junior or you're the only person like you in an environment that's not that diverse. Don't be afraid to be the only person that stands out. Don't be afraid to bring your own unique set of knowledge to where everyone el- to an environment where everyone else seems to have the same. Perfect. And Blair. Yeah. Um, so just to echo, you know, everything from earlier, um, just be passionate, uh, you know, stay curious, be resilient, and uh, just trust yourself. Well, I want to thank all of our panelists today, Maria, Adam, Taylor, Blair. Thank you so much for your for your time and your expertise. And I know from the comments that we've gotten from many of the students, they've really appreciated it, and, and you guys have inspired them. So that's that's always a nice way to end a panel and add one of end one of our cybersecurity chats. So I want to thank you, um, students and teachers, for joining our panel today of a young our young professionals panel on the behalf of the National. Cryptologic Museum Foundation, thanks so much for participating, and we hope to see you on another chat. Thanks so much. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, everyone. (laughs) All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. 